Hello everyone, you're listening to the Earful Tower Podcast. My name is Oliver G and I'm not going to beat around the bush today, rather the opposite. We're in the city. This is a city life episode. This is an on-the-go episode where I'm going to walk you down Rue Montorgueil, one of my favorite streets uh, on the planet, I'd say. It's in the second arrondissement of Paris. I'm going to walk you from the south to the north end with special guest Véro from France with Véro. Uh, you can check her out on uh, all social media platforms. She was on the show almost exactly a year ago teaching us all about the apéro tradition. And I just listened to that. Uh, I said at the start of that episode that she has 25,000 Facebook followers. And get this, 33,000 now. She must be doing something right. Go and check her out. Uh, before I get into the episode, I want to say... It was brought to you by the Patreon supporters. And uh, if you're not a Patreon supporter, let me tell you what you're missing out on this specific episode. Uh, Last week, I walked from the north end to the south end of Rue Montorgueil with Veru, and we live-streamed the whole thing for my Patreon members and her Patreon members at the same time. And uh, that means we were going up... Uh, pointing to the cheeses, the cafes, the restaurants, the bakeries, and explaining how they've changed. Uh, you'll hear in this episode, uh, you know, I used to live there about eight years ago, so the whole thing has changed. Vero gives us the inside word. And uh, as a special bonus, Augusta, the photographer, was following us along. I've already seen the pictures. They're brilliant. So uh, to watch the replay of that walk show, the live video from Paris, and to see more in the future, become a member, patreon.com slash the earful tower for all you guys sitting at home or in your car or going for a walk right now thinking well that's me i'm a member to you i say merci beaucoup and instead of intro music this week to set the scene it's rue montagueil 7 p.m on a friday night people are out uh, en masse en terrasse and having a good night hopefully you'll feel like you're there with us I'll be back at the end for a little bit more information of things that are happening and a curious follow-up from the Kane story last week. Let's stroll down Rue Montagoy. I'm standing here with none other than Véro. Bonsoir, Oliver. Bonsoir, how, how, how are you? I am well. It's a lovely evening. It is actually a perfect evening. It's like the, 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 there was pink in the sky. Yeah, uh, we had the, a sunset. We had a sunset and we yes. sat down at the beautiful La Grille. La Grille? <laughs> La Grille, you said it well. And uh, it feels like, I don't know, it feels like spring is in the air, so it's absolutely wonderful. And I thought uh, you and I could talk a little about Rue Montagoy as we walk from the south end to the north end. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, the sounds in the background, I want people to picture, if we pause for a second, right behind you there's a guy who's uh, cleaning up his, his butcher shop. Uh, and to the left are the guys sweeping up after the ice from their fish shop. That's what I'm smelling. I'm smelling fish. <laughs> I stopped you right in front of the fish shop. <laughs> but um, it feels to me to be very... It feels to me that this is a very local area. You said before we press record it's become a touristy area. It, I think it's unique, the street, because it's both local. It's both favorite uh, favorite with locals and with tourists. It's been featured heavily on social media in recent years, so we have both. Mm. So it's, if you will, it's a place in Paris where locals meet tourists mm. or visitors, as I like to say. Okay. So it's nice. But then, so the tourists are finding out about it through Instagram or something? Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of places, a lot of... Um, I think content creators have featured it heavily in recent years. Oh, no, Uh, I'm doing it now. You are doing it now. I've done it as well. And so it's become, you know, it's been put on the map, really. Yeah. And it's changed a lot. So it's interesting to see what's happened here. Well, it's funny that you say that because we just did a half-hour walk for both of our uh, Patreon, Patreon communities. Yes. Um, And we point out a lot of things that are new or that seem to have changed. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are a few things that have been here for seemingly hundreds of years. True. Does this do the balance well, this street, you think? I think it still does. But if it went a little heavier on the what I call new Paris, then it would really tip over. Uh, we in a bad st- way? In a bad yeah. way. To me, yeah. not everybody agrees. People have uh, spreadsheets and lists and they love to see what's new in Paris. They come here to try new pastries and new food trends. Great. 
for me, when the old Paris goes, and in sections of the city it's Boom. going... Oh, yeah, you know he it. was enthusiastic. No, for anyone, Hello. anyone at home who doesn't think we're really recording on the street, there's now, your proof. No, talk to me on my left ear now, because my right one is dead. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's walk and talk. Actually. Okay, so yeah, I think in, in places in Paris, the old Paris is now almost gone, and I find that a little sad. I'm a bit of a nostalgic, oh. maybe, but I think at this point, the street still has both. Well, the street still has both. It's funny that you say that as we pass Stora. Yes. Because do, uh, do you remember the year that that's from? Uh, I know it's in the 18th century under Louis XV. Right. So it might have been the first half of the 18th century for sure. So anyone in any doubt that there are old things can rest assured because that... Yes. <laughs> those pastries are old. We And like we said earlier to our patrons, I think, we have Stora, the oldest pastry uh, shop in, in Paris and definitely on the street. We have Le Rocher de that restaurant created during the first empire in the early 1800s where people still eat oysters. We have uh, other other businesses that are still here from that time. And and then we have all these new new Paris pastry shops and they're wonderful. And it's not just pastry. As we walk on the left is a shop, a burger joint called Manhattan's without the E. So yeah, Manha- that's Manha- really interesting Manhattan. that name. Um, it must be somebody's name. You think? No, I, that's. Don't you think? I think it's like when uh, someone creates a new startup in like the Nordic countries and they just leave out a few vowels <laughs> to look cool. That's what I think is happening. Also, as we as we're walking right now, we're passing what you just mentioned, Au Rocher de Concal. Concal, that's right. Uh, the most beautiful blue restaurant. Anyone you'll be able to see will share pictures of that. Oh, in- and the lights! Look at the lights! It's beautiful. You know what? If we just move away from it, you know what I've always thought. One of the most telltale signs that you're a tourist in Paris. This is uh-huh. quite obvious. When you block you, the way. N- no, when you carry a suitcase on wheels through the I, town. Actually, there are two ways. They're carrying the suitcase, which you can all hear in the background, and there's also walking side by side and blocking the sidewalk yeah. for locals who are trying to get somewhere. Yeah. That's the sure sign of a tourist. You get very oblivious as a tourist. Well, you're I, having fun. True, but I, I mean, that's for me. That's when I noticed. For me, that's when I noticed that the tourists had come back after COVID, was the, when I started seeing the, the suitcases sound. on the street. Yeah, yeah. But also, I think, I personally think, like, uh, I think it's a really bad entrance to Paris is to take the subway and then walk three blocks to your apartment. <laughs> that's hard. I think, like, even if you can stretch the budget to take a taxi from the airport, it yes. makes your entry to the city so much better because carrying a bag through the street like that... Well, especially since Paris is one of the least accessible subway systems in Europe. Especially uh, with bags. Uh, with bags. You really do not want to put yourself through that. And just for first impressions, mm. because first impressions do matter, I totally agree with you. You are in Paris for a week. You're going to be spending money. Just splurge on a cab from the airport mm. and have him drop you off right out outside your hotel or apartment rental. Yeah. Much better. Even inside if they'll do it for you. <laughs> Carry the bags, mate. <laughs> Go up the five floors. When we, uh, the other reason I stopped here is because on a personal note, uh, we're standing on the intersection of Montaigueil and Grenetta, La which is Grenetta. where I spent the first two years of my mm-hmm. Paris life. It's mm-hmm. with great nostalgia that I look down the street. It is, and and we said earlier, right, uh, there is a plaque now with your name down that street. (laughs) It's a famous street, Oliver, because you lived here once. Uh, Number 48, I think, for anyone who wants to go find it. How far down is it? It's about 150 meters. It's not worth it. It's not, you don't want to. You're being self-conscious now. But no, no, but I tell you, look at anyone that ever comes here and follows our footsteps, look at the cobblestone pattern, because it's quite unusual. It's pretty. Do you see the way they've done wavy? It's like a wave. Yeah, there is a wave. And they've got it on Montague as well. It's one of the special... I don't know how they did it. So you see in Groneta, the street we're on. So to me, this this screams old Paris, which is why I love it. Nobody famous except Oliver might have lived there. But when you see the Rocher de Concal on the right-hand side, you see how concave, is that the word concave? Yeah, sure. The facade is, that says how they used to be. So you still have those facades. And then you look down the street, you see this happening. And those lights, those lights that were probably here still in the 19th, already in the 19th century. This is old Paris. Mm. And I love that right off of Trendy, Rue Montorgueil, you still have streets like Rue Grenetta, where you make you feel like you're traveling back in time. Amazing. That's why it's special. I think uh, Balzac. 
yeah. wrote about this street. Balzac loved the street. It's mentioned very often in his books and other uh, Zola How as well. How do you know that? What, How you do, know that? They mentioned this Balzac? street? Balzac? Yeah. Yes, because I, I read Balzac and because I live in Tours in the Loire Valley and this is his hometown. So uh-huh. Balzac is a big celebrity down there. What, in Tours, is he? In Tours. He was born in Tours. And so Balzac came back to the Touraine region where I live. So I, I know quite a bit about Balzac also I studied him in high school fancy that yeah you know I've been meaning to come down and visit you in tour you should how you long should have you been a special? there for? Um, I moved in the spring of 2021 so it will be two so, years so it's overdue that I have come it's overdue visit. you oh. should come and then we could do a fun live stroll there there's a How's lot the to internet see. down there very good yeah. well Mm, I say it with sections. a smile because I know when I, I know. when I've been around France sometimes it can yes, be yes the, the the old stones the old historic area can be a little challenging like everywhere else in France but I know the spots where the the cell signal's good I've done enough live streams down there so. and do you do tours in tours yep, I, I lead, call it tours because there's an yeah, S I know it's a mouthful it's tours in tour I do lead neighborhood tours in my city and cover the history of uh, this glorious city which is one of the most underrated cities in France. Uh, most people don't know that it was the capital of France in the 15th century for about 80 years before Paris. Everyone who follows you knows that. Of course they yeah. do. I've, I've, I've done my best to share, you know, the beautiful Loire Valley. How far are you from Lake Chenonceau and the other chateaux? Not far at all. And uh, tour makes a great gateway to the Loire Valley. It has a very central location. And so a lot of my patrons come and visit now. I show, you know, I take them on tours in the city and then they go on trains and explore the area. We have so many beautiful chateaus, abbeys, places to see down there. Everyone at home, if you want to see me and Vero collaborate on a uh, tour kind of episode video, whenever you see pictures from this walk or whatever, write, go to tour, Oliver, and I'll count them all up. And if it's over 40, I'll be on the next yeah. Is there a TGV that goes Yeah, there? TGV is very fast, an hour and 10 minutes or so, and oh, you'll wow. be there. I know, it's practically the suburbs. And how much does it cost? It's uh, it's a little pricey, I think, because of the TGV, but you can get a round trip for about 50 euros. Oh, that's a deal. Yeah, okay. so you should come. Well, it's not and up I'll to me. I'll take you to my favorite square where the half-timbered homes, medieval homes. I think we have prettier, prettier medieval homes than Paris does. It's well, going to shock some people, but I'll st- I'm standing my ground right well, here. I'm a big fan of half-timbered house. Everybody knows that. Well, there you go. Um, it's not up to me either. It's up to the commenters on social media. It's that quite simple. That is right. You have just asked them to react, and we will see what happens. Uh, for anyone following at home on the map wondering where we're up to, we're up to Rue Saint-Sauveur, Saint-Sauveur in the <laughs> second hour of this month, which, if we pause for a second, is a very beautiful street, actually. Like, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of cool new bars and restaurants opening up down yes. there there was when I was living here so mm-hmm. I can only imagine that it's all the side streets away from uh, the Rue Montorgueil that's what we were saying are just a younger crowd so lots of bars uh, lots of clothing shops as well and that's a trend in Paris right now isn't it mm-hmm. a lot of uh, cool trendy clothing stores but the bars definitely in fact I spot a few right now so. I, don't, I don't even like I, I, for anyone who hasn't been to Paris for a couple of years I feel that like you won't even recognize Montagoy. And that's the same about a lot of neighborhoods in Paris, in fact. Because mm. uh, I moved away less than two years ago now, and there are sections when I walk around and it's already changed. Well, I mean, just right behind you where we're standing is the Café Biard. The Café Biard, B-I-A-R-D. Mm-hmm. And if you've been to Paris in the last five years, you'd recognize it as a toy shop mm-hmm. or a paper shop or a stationery yeah, shop. board games, whatever they were selling there for many years. But it used to be in the 1900s. Neither of us was born then. But in the 1900s, they had cafes, uh, Biard had cafes all over Paris yeah. and the facade is protected which is why the new bakery inside cannot change it and, and that's that. and the reason that I'm bringing it up is because it's such a beautiful facade with beautiful. mosaic uh, titles blue. at the top blue. beautiful blue panels and gold mosaic yeah it, yeah. it rivals uh, Concal down the road as one of the prettiest it, facades it, it on does. the street. It does. And so now, if you're wondering, Jeffrey Cagny is here. He's a pastry chef who worked at Storer, which I think we mentioned. Yes. The oldest pastry shop on the street. He worked there for about 15, 20 years. And then he opened his own shop just last December here. And he has others in Paris as well. He does incredible creations. Very tasty pastries. I might have to check that out on the way yeah, home. You will have Let's to. keep walking. When we started the uh, YouTube video that we did, we started at the very top, the north end of this street, where there's a Starbucks and a McDonald's. As a <laughs> yeah. French woman, how does that make you feel? Not so good. Why? Um, 
I think Starbucks serves a purpose. They've come in handy whenever I traveled, especially around the United States. But I like to say that if I lived the United States after 23 years, it wasn't to live in France the way Americans do. So um, Starbucks and McDonald's, I don't tend to patronize while I'm in France, no. I remember when the McDonald's opened up here. Yeah. People, there were petitions that everyone dropped in the letterboxes saying uh, you know block the McDonald's oh it was worse than petitions there was a a guy a farmer named José Bové have you heard of him um, B-O-V-E Mons- Monsieur Bové oui, Monsieur oui. Bové oui, absolument. He, he actually staged revolts or rebellions against McDonald's destroyed a McDonald's restaurant I think it was somewhere in the center of France and he took the people hostage I mean it was a big deal they Is- really tried to stop it what okay oh, yeah. I was kidding I hadn't heard about him no, before yeah, this yeah, sounds yeah. serious I could tell you were joking <laughs> José Bové look him up he became a politician later on and he's a, he's a guy who's a, an ecologist so a, a green member of the Green Party and he was he was one of the strongest opponents of McDonald's when they started here. I believe it was in the 70s or 80s. He wasn't very successful. Well, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, McDonald's, uh, France is the second most profitable market for McDonald's in the world after the United States. And I will be honest, that makes me a little sad. Really? You know what will make you even more sad? What? I know you haven't seen the third season of Emily in Paris yet, but I have. No, I won't watch it. Uh, spo- <laughs> I've, I've seen enough. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert for anyone watching. Uh, they do a collaboration with McDonald's. They have you something. Are kidding. It's called like the Mc Emily or the Mc Baguette or something. Oh, like that. a Mc Emily. Yeah, so sweet. I don't know. Sweet. Maybe I made that up. I think it might have been. Mc- is it pink? <laughs> I think it was Mc Baguette. <laughs> but it was like I was like, whoa! This is uh, McDonald's is a sponsor of this show. Like they really. McDonald's, I've got to say, um, has the absolute best marketing. I love marketing. I used to work in marketing, so. McDonald's has the best marketing and advertising team probably in France and has had for the last three or four decades. If you compare with your Disney, Disney, when they arrived in France in the 90s, who did everything wrong, they should have learned from McDonald's. What what do you mean? What happened when they did everything wrong? Can Uh, you summarize it? Oh, it's hard to summarize, but Disney basically came with an American model and tried to you know, set it up in France and failed on many levels. There were strikes, the, you know, the staff rebelled. By the time they realized they were doing it wrong, they replaced the management team, everything. And now it's called Disneyland. They even had to change the name because it was such a bad, you know, your Disney was not successful. Had they taken a training course from the McDonald's marketing team, who is so good at talking to French people and other local cultures, with references they understand, they would have done much better. The things we learn on a walk with Vero, I always say it. <laughs> I always say it. Let's keep walking. Uh, before so hats off to McDonald's, huh? Yeah, what they enough. do, they do well. We were talking, I don't know if it was uh, privately, yep. after the Patreon video just then. Yep. But um, let's walk on the street away from these noisy youths. Um, <laughs> youths. <laughs> youths. <laughs> we, we were talking about the differences between the famous market streets. Yes. And uh, I've... I've been quite vocal in saying Montego is my favorite when I yes. lived here, and then yeah. Rue des Abbesses in Montmartre was my favorite. And then the next one will be your favorite when you move. When I move, wherever that may be, will wherever, be the next. Because there'll be a market street, you yeah, just I know, know it. I know, but yeah. uh, currently it's Rue Claire in the 7th. I know, you love Rue Claire. Love Rue you Claire. and Rick Steves love yeah. Rue Claire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, what about uh, you? What do you find to be your favorite market street in the city of Paris? Uh, the long answer, sorry. Uh, oh, we need a short answer because okay. we're nearing the end of the street. Okay, well, if it's for me, it would be Rue de Lévis or Rue d'Aguerre. Rue de Lévis in the 17th where I used to live or Rue d'Aguerre in the 14th arrondissement by Donfer Rochereau. If it's for visitors who want to experience a market street, I would recommend Montorgueil because it encapsulates French and Parisian life. I agree with you. And I think the two, Lévis and Daguerre, are a, they're a little bit, they're off the tourist track. Totally. And they're not pretty. They're not postcards. They're not trying to be though even there I've got to say old Paris slowly but surely is losing ground and you can see it but do you find Rue Claire to be postcardy yes yeah in a good yes. way yes no well, if you like postcards, if you like Emily in Paris, you will like Rue Claire, I good, guess. Good, good, good. I mean, I'm not a huge Emily in Paris fan, but I do like Rue Claire. Yeah. Um, as we near the end of uh, Rue Montreuil, or is yeah. it, I notice you've been saying La Rue Montreuil. La Rue Montreuil. Is it like a respectable way No, to... I just say La Rue Montreuil, La Rue Claire. Okay. I just say La, I guess. 
Well, Look, one of the round buildings you love so much. It the is. The domes. Yeah. The late 19th century domes. So at the end of Montague, Vera is pointing out across the road, there is one of those beautiful dome buildings. Yes. It's not, uh, it's a bit of a weird one. My yeah, perfectly. It's a little elongated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the clouds behind it, though. Yeah, we've, we've picked a magic night for it. But um, we've come to the edge of the big, uh, you can probably hear the big road at home there. Yeah. Uh, Ré au mur. Ré au mur. That's the hardest one to pronounce. Ré au mur. Yeah, no, I don't he know. Was a, even... He was a prefect of Paris that nobody ever talks about. Everybody talks about houseman. Because no one can pronounce his name. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be a good reason. <laughs> but we've made it to the end of the street. And I'll, I'll end on this question for you. Uh -huh. For tourists coming to Paris and hoping to experience a popular street like this, but who are maybe a bit shy, they don't feel they know the French culture, they don't know how to see it or order a beer or anything do you have any cheats for people to feel more at ease on a street like this yeah well first thing you, 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 the French have an expression lèche vitrine window licking so that doesn't only apply to shopping and looking at windows to decide what you're going to buy this can also apply to a street like Rue Montorgueil, when you're trying to get your bearings and get used to the surroundings and check out maybe a cafe where you'd like to sit down. So what I would say is walk the length of the street once, spot a couple of cafe terraces where you'd like to sit, spot the boulangerie where you'd like to buy a croissant, spot the fromagerie where you'd like to buy cheese, grow your confidence, build your confidence, walk the street back, and the second time, just go inside and watch what locals do. If there is a line, watch what locals do. Use the magic word, bonjour, no matter what you ask for, say bonjour, and you've heard this before, I know, and then go for it. Jump in. So basically do a recon mission. Recon mission. Go up and down the street, yes. lick everything once. Yes. And then go back and do it for real. Yes. There's so many cafes here. Did you see how many cafes are alongside the street now? It's frightening. It's frightening. So there's a lot to choose from. So find a terrace or a table that looks appealing. It's not too crowded. And then build your confidence and grab that table. It's yours. And there you go. You enter Parisian life. That's how you do it. And on that note, Vero, I want to go and do the exact same thing with you. Shall we have a glass of wine? I think so. I think we've earned it. Well, let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So there you have it once again, Rue Montaigueuil with Vero from France with Vero, uh, V-E-R-O. It's all linked down below. Follow her on social media. You can become a patron of hers as well and uh, see all the stuff that she's sharing about Paris and France too. Uh, I said that I'd come with a story about the Canes. Here is what it is. Uh, if you've missed on social media all the videos and all the posts about those magical Canes from last week, uh, not only have you been missing out, but you've been missing out on some of the comments. And one that really caught my eye that I want to read is from Rachel Jane Fowler. And she said, I thought this week's episode was not, she's referring to the Kane episode, I thought this week's episode was not going to be my cup of tea. Ha ha! I was intrigued, and then I arrived home to see my parents in New Orleans, and I had a revelation. I'd been passing old Kane's every trip up and down their stairs. Little did I know, one of these canes had a hidden gadget. Were it not for you and Chloe, no one in the house would have known it was there. And so she'd uh, sent a little video with four or five canes, ornate, decorative-looking canes, but there was one uh, with a sort of round globe-shaped top on it, made of maybe brass, and it looks like it's been unscrewed to reveal what I think is called the Toulouse-Lautrec uh, gadget, which is like a, a long, it's like a test tube with a cork in the top that was used probably to smuggle a little bit of absinthe in wherever you're going. I wonder if there was also the little glass with it like there was in the cane shop. But um, how cool. It, makes, it actually makes me want to go and look at canes in old garage sales or uh, brocantes, the flea markets in Paris, to see if I can find a similar hidden gadget. But it's kind of a metaphor for not just for canes or Paris or this show, everything really. Uh, you never know what you'll find if you just dare to look. That could be the motto of this very show. On that note, I'll leave it to Press Maxon, our resident musician, to take us out with a little bit of music. 
Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'll be back again next week with another episode. Merci beaucoup and au revoir.